What's up guys, Professor Jay here again at Organized Biology, and this is a perfect lecture for my channel's name, Organized Biology, because we are going to be going through the levels of organization of an organism. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically zoom as far in as physically possible, and then slowly start zooming out and seeing how smaller parts become a greater and greater and bigger and bigger part to create a whole organism. Now, this is a very complex thing because you can't study every single aspect of anatomy and physiology in a vacuum. It's all connected. Everything is made up of other things. And so what we're going to do is we're going to tear it all the way apart to the atomic level, and we're going to build it slowly and slowly up until we see an organism in all its beauty and glory. So let's get started. It may take a little bit, but I think it will be incredibly helpful. So to start off, all matter, all stuff you see, that you breathe, that you're touching and feeling is made up of atoms because atoms are the base unit of all stuff. So with atoms, if you look at the periodic table, you can see every element, which is another name for an atom, a type of atom, you will see every atom known to mankind at the moment, okay? But we're gonna focus on several specific ones in anatomy and physiology, most of which are on the board right now. So we've got our five key atoms that are conducive to life, which is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus, also called schnapp. So if somebody says schnapp in your science class, you'll know it's just those five atoms that are really conducive to life. Now in an atom, real quick, we have a nucleus, so the center part, which has protons that are positive and neutrons that are neutral. And then on the outside you have, so if this is the nucleus, you will have electrons flowing around that nucleus at super, super fast speeds. So this is where all energy comes from, is from those transfer of electrons because they're the ones moving. They have all this kinetic energy. <clears throat> yeah, we're going into physics. They have all this motion energy that if they bind with something else, well now the energy is transferred to something different and then that can do something different and that can do something different. Okay, so it's all about these flow of electrons. So let me give you an example. When we're talking about calcium, for example, in, a, in anatomy physiology course, a lot of the times we will write it as Ca2+. Now, what Ca2+, well, what this means is that it lost two electrons, which electrons are negatively charged. So if it loses two electrons, well, guess what? It becomes a positive two charge. Okay, so now we've got a positive two charge calcium ion that's really, it actually dissolves in water better. And this will do very specific things for the cell. And we're going to talk about that in later detail. So whenever you see something with a positive or, let's say, chlorine with a negative one charge, that just means that it is in its ionized form. It is now a charged element. And that will behave in a certain way. And we'll see that a lot more later on. But just know that if you see a positive or negative charge, that just means that the atom has become ionized. It's either lost or gained an electron, okay? So those are atoms. Now, when we put atoms together, we create what's called molecules. And whenever I say put them together, it means that they are bonding. And most of the time when we're talking about biology, we're going to say that these are covalent bonds. That means they are sharing electrons between one another. So I drew carbon here, okay? So this carbon atom could share some electrons with another carbon atom and join together basically. And those are shown by these lines, okay? So these just mean that there's a covalent bond between atoms. Why are these important? Well, all of organic chemistry, all of the things we're looking at in biology too, biochemistry, is watching what happens to these bonds, what happens to these shared electrons between atoms, and how are they going to transfer over into different places, okay? And within these bonds, I always tell my students that these bonds, they store energy. So all of these bonds store a lot of energy in between them. Think of it as like, so if you shake somebody's hand, right? When you shake somebody's hand, you have energy here, you have stored energy because if somebody tries to break these, 
like if somebody tries to break your handshake, it would take a lot of energy. If you're holding really tight, they would really have to push and pull and then boom. When they break, when bonds break, it releases energy. When bonds are formed, it stores energy. So try to think of it that way. So I've got a few different molecules up here, and this is how we write them. This has an O bonded to a C, which is bonded to another O. Double bonds here, there's two bonds. So think of like two arms holding. And this would be written as CO2. Now why? Because you have one C and you have two oxygens. So C1, technically, O2, carbon dioxide. We've heard of that before. Over here, we've got HOH, also, also known as H2O, water. Two O's is O2, which this is an oxygen molecule. Okay, so even though it's just one atom type, if you have two or more atoms together, it's considered a molecule. So these are a few basic molecules, which once again are just atoms joining together in some way, shape, or form. I showed covalent bonding, however, we can also have what's called ionic bonding when, say, two negative one chlorines could bond with calcium, which is positive two, and we would get, say, CaCl2. So this would be an ionic bond because they're turning into their ions and then they're coming together really hard, whereas covalent bonding is when they're sharing electrons. So this is more chemistry and physics. However, I, it is very important to understand those concepts before we move on to anatomy. So let's keep building up. So we've got some molecules here. Well, now what if we have a ton and a ton, a ton of atoms chained together into this big molecule? Well, what do we call it? Macro molecules. Macro means big, so like macroeconomics, looking at the whole of economics. Macro molecules just means a big molecule. There's four types. Now, if you are a fitness guru, you may have heard, oh, I gotta get my macros in today. You're usually talking about three of them, and that is your carbohydrates, so like your grains, your lipids, which are fats, whether it's from a plant source or a uh, animal source, like uh, steak, all that stuff, butter. Um, you can also have plant butters, which would be a plant-based uh, type of lipid. It's also just another name for fat. And you have proteins, so that's meat, right? Uh, you can also get proteins from like soybeans and different things like that, but proteins are basically the building blocks of life. Now, why do I say that? Proteins can be incredibly specific. So think about all the different types of, I don't know, notebooks there are, right? There's small notebooks, there's big notebooks, there's really long notebooks, there's blueprints. There's all these sorts of structures of notebooks that are functioning for a certain purpose. So depending on the structure, the size, the shape, the orientation of a protein, they're gonna be doing different things. And that's true for all of them, but especially for proteins. They are the building blocks of specifically cells, which we'll get to, but I'll just say of living things. Okay, so those are the three main macromolecules that you may have heard of already, but nucleic acids is another one. Nucleic acids, some examples you may have heard of are DNA, so your instruction manual for how to build your body. It's also in all living things. You also may have heard of mRNA from the COVID-19 vaccine that came out. It was an mRNA vaccine. And you may not know this, but ATP, if you've ever learned about ATP in class, adenosine triphosphate is kind of the energy currency of the cell. So it's going to, a cell, a living thing is going to use ATP as its energy source. Okay, so that's a nucleic acid. Once again, let's just step back. These are big molecules made of many, many atoms put together into this big chain or circle or whatever the orientation is. And those are all made up of atoms. Now we're gonna leap forward. If we put macromolecules together, so these four basic ones, we can form organelles. Now this is very specific to living things because we're gonna talk about cells here in a second. Organelles are literally miniature organs within a cell. So I have three of them on here and I want you to see the way I colored them. We've got this weird looking octopus thing. We've got, it looks like a protein here. Looks like we got some lipids here. 
We've got another protein here, and we've also got some carbohydrates kind of floating on the outside. This is the cell membrane. We'll talk about this in a lot of detail, but this is the cell membrane. And as you can see, it contains many different macromolecules. Now, I didn't have a nucleic acid in there, but the other three, the cell membrane is made of. You may have heard from a teacher in the past that the cell membrane is a lipid, and that is true. However, we use the term, it's a, flu a fluid mosaic model because it's not just lipids. It's got a bunch of proteins. It's got a bunch of carbohydrates. It's got a bunch of glycoproteins, which are carbohydrates bonded to the proteins. And it's got all of these things floating around and pulling things in. It's basically this big gatekeeper of the cell. Okay, so it has to have so many different specific macromolecules within it to help its function. Okay, we'll talk more about its function later. Now let's look at this guy. This guy has a lot of nucleic acids. This is specifically DNA. It's got some proteins inside and it's surrounded once again by a membrane. This is your nucleus. Your nucleus, think of it as like world's top secret bookstore, right? Uh, so like a restricted section. If you've ever watched Harry Potter, they have the restricted section. It's really hard to get into, but what you can do is you can go into that section, read something, and then take that transcript out, but the book's got to stay in there. So that's DNA. The DNA stays within the nucleus, bound together by different proteins inside of it, and it's surrounded by this membrane to kind of keep it protected from other things inside of the cell, but also to let certain things in or out so that it can function properly. And finally, we've got this weird inner folded thing with an oval. This is the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, right? So if you don't learn anything in biology, that's usually what you know. This is the powerhouse of the cell. And as you can see, we talked about structure and function in a different video, but the mitochondria has this inner folded membrane. It increases the surface area because in that inner membrane, ATP, energy currency molecule, is being produced. So the more surface area you have, so the more it's like kind of wound up, the more and more ATP can be made all along that little uh, inner membrane folded section. So that's the mitochondria. It's going to make ATP. Now, these are organelles, miniature organs within a cell. Okay, so now let's move on to the cell. And why did I put cell on the separate bottom section? Because all living things are made of cells. Okay, cells are the basic unit of life. So we put all of these things together into this beautiful, I guess like mosaic, it's going to turn into a cell. Now that's not to say that like, I don't know, my desk is made of plastic, right? It's made of atoms and molecules, but it doesn't have the higher organization. It's not living. A thing is only classified as living if it's made of cells. Okay. That's the basic cell theory. So Basic unit of life. As you can see, I've drawn a bunch of different types of cells. These are all different types of cells that, that are in your body. This one would be something like an epithelial cell, so something like your skin. This one lines your respiratory tract. It's a strata, or I believe it's pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So it has this little cilia that can pull dust particles out of your throat, and then you cough <clears throat> to get them out. This is also a nerve cell. It transmits electrical electrical electrochemical impulses, there we go, down an axon to uh, transmit different messages and signals. And then this is a car uh, myocyte, so a muscle cell, okay? So they have these different structures, and we'll talk in detail about those different things later on. But just know that as you put all these organelles into a cell, that one cell is the base unit of life. But cells don't act by themselves, okay? Not in a big organism like you. Okay, cells have to act in concert with each other, so together. And when you put a bunch of similar structured and similar function cells together, you make what's called a tissue. So I've drawn several cells kind of in a sheet. And this sheet shows basically your skin. Okay, your skin is very thin, but it's very rigid and it can stretch a little bit too. So you don't want things to get into your skin, otherwise you can get infected and that type of thing. So you're gonna have a lot of layers of cells working together to stay strong together 
and while stretchy, you don't want it to rip, right? So they're going to look very similar. That's an epithelial tissue type. On the bottom, I showed a nervous tissue type. So you've got all these neurons sending information, but you also have a lot of different cells that are supporting it. So you've got these little astrocytes right here that are going to hold them together and nourish it. There are also things called Schwann cells that help insulate the neuron. So there's a lot of different cells within the same tissue working together to help the function, right? So once again, it's just all these cells put together in a similar area with similar functions to help the overall function. So the four main types of these, and there's so many different subheadings under them, are epithelial, there's connective, muscular, and nervous tissue. So these are all different types of tissue, and we'll go through the individual ones probably here in a later episode, uh, but I'm just going to move on from there. Once you take a bunch of tissue and you zoom as far out as you can while keeping the same function, you will get organs. And you've probably heard of organs before, right? So you've got your heart, your lungs, your brain, uh, you've got your, goodness gracious, uh, liver, pancreas, gallbladder, kidneys, spleen, etc. Those are all organs. Now, some of them are more major organs and some are more accessory, but they're all organs nonetheless. They are main, they're maintained by a bunch of tissues put together into one structure that has the same function, which is an organ, right? So, I drew this guy, and see if you can drop in the comments what this is, I won't tell you, but this is one specific organ. As you can see, the structure determines its function. So it's got kind of this long track going up, over to the side, down, and then out. So perhaps this has something to do with the digestive system, bringing things through the body and then out of the body. So see if you can drop in the comments what this organ is. Finally, when we put organs together, so maybe one organ has a certain function. So the heart is going to pump blood, right? But the heart also needs to get oxygen to its cells. And it also has to get oxygen all the way throughout. That's the goal of the heart, basically, is to pump oxygen uh, as well as other nutrients throughout the body. So where does it get the oxygen? Well, it pumps and part of it goes to the lungs. When you breathe in, you breathe in oxygen that diffuses into your red blood cells, which go back to your heart to be pumped out to the rest of the body. So that's called the cardiovascular system. So cardio meaning heart, vasculature meaning, uh, um, vascular meaning your vessels. Um, and so if you put the cardiovascular system with the respiratory system, your breathing, that's kind of one main system together. So it's working together to nourish your body with oxygen but they have different sort of functions. So your lungs don't pump, your heart pumps. Your heart doesn't inflate like your lungs do because the structure determines the function, okay? So finally, those are organ systems. So I have this great, I don't know if this is a mnemonic or acronym still, but I say that organ systems are remembered best by remembering my cruel Dr. Minns, who was my fake anatomy professor. Cruel Dr. Minns stands for every single organ system in the human body. Cardiovascular, reproductive, urinary, endocrine, lymphatic, digestive, respiratory, muscular, integumentary, nervous, and oh my goodness, S. <laughs> Drop in the comments what S is. Oh, I just remembered it, but I'm going to make you remember it. So I drew one of them, <clears throat> and these are your kidneys connected by your readers to the urinary bladder and then your urethra. The goal of these organs working together in a system is to basically pee out the waste you don't need and reabsorb in the kidney what you would like to hold onto, okay? So even though there are multiple organs working together, like organs, they have a common function. They're working in a system because in order for an organism to survive, you need a bunch of organ systems working together properly in order for you to maintain what's called homeostasis, a stable set of internal conditions, both for your whole body and your cells in general. So once again, I'll step to the side. This is the levels of organization of the human body or any organism, and I hope this was helpful. Once again, be sure to subscribe and like this video if it helped you out. 
please drop any questions you may have below. And we're going to go into more detail of all of these different topics in a later video. I hope this was helpful. Hope you guys are having a great day and we'll talk to you soon.